This week's movie, Who Am I? I am one of three trappers who become the protectors of a colonel's daughter in the midst of a bloody war, one that costs more than we bargained for. Stay tuned to find out. You're listening to the Banana Reel Movie Podcast, episode 39. Warning, this show does contain spoilers and coarse language, so you've been forewarned. Hey there, folks. We are the Theatre Gorillas. My name is Carlos. I'm Heath. And it's just us two for tonight. So uh, we're... Yeah, for tonight. Oh, yes. It's a nice rendezvous. A rendezvous. (laughs) Speaking of French. um, Yes. (laughs) We're taking a look at uh, a nice uh, movie about a French man today. But before we get into that, we'll do the usual spiel. Oh, indeed. So you can always get us at our website, which is theatregrillers.com or Twitter, which is at theatregrillers, facebook.com forward slash theatregrillers. We're on YouTube, so just search for us. And of course, if you ever want to send us some feedback or contact us in some way, you can do so via email, which is theatregrillers at gmail.com, all spelt the UK English way. Did you mention YouTube? Yes, I did. Oh, excellent. Yes. So as we said before, we are looking at the walk. <laughs> Starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Can't pronounce some of these French names. I know, they're really hard, aren't they? <laughs> but uh, Ben Kingsley. Oh, yeah, Ben Kingsley, of course. Yeah, he's, he, that one was easy. But, uh, yeah, th- this movie is essentially, I suppose, is it a biopic? Yeah, it's a biographical yeah. kind of drama telling the story of... Philippe Petit. Yes, Philippe Petit, who was, or actually, no, is uh, the only person to ever walk... A wire between the twin towers yes. of uh, of New York, uh, which of course are uh, sadly no longer there. You know, after nine eleven. But uh, yes, it was actually. I. It's a really good historical piece, actually, because you know he did it covertly. Yeah, like it was not a planned with the city of New York thing. It was completely illegal. It was before the buildings were actually officially opened. Like they'd only just they been hadn't completed. Even been finished being built. Yes, actually, that's exactly right. There were still flaws that were not completed, and he organized it and cut it. And he fucking did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the way this movie is presented is even really interesting. Plot wise, look, this movie is very simple. It, it is just a, a, a recount recount of how. How Felipe came up with the idea of walking his tightrope wire. Yes. Um, on something that people would see, something historical, he definitely wanted that. You can tell by the way he was always searching for, I, I don't know whether it was fame, but he... he, he yeah, he it, he wanted. It, it's like this drive that he wanted to. Um, well, like he's impress ca- people. Well, like his character, you know, uh, like he he kind of always said he like even as a child he he always wanted to do something artistic and his artistic was kind of in the well for him was the kind of the circus uh kind of um, art form so the juggling the the kind of magic the you know the tr- the illusions but he also he had he loved tightrope walking he lo- he just he was kind of you get the vibe in the movie anyway that he was uh just astounded by it and that he wanted to kind of throw himself into that world but he didn't just want to simply do tightrope walking you know he wanted to be a showman he wanted to be a showman and he wanted to do something that no one had ever done before or that no one would ever do again. And he achieved it. Yeah, like, and he definitely. Did it. I mean, it, it's, you know, 400 metres in the air. Yeah. He's <laughs> doing 100 stories and he did it. And once again, he did it without the organisation of the city and or anything like that. He did it all well with a group of people, as we will talk about two after. trusted friends, the advice of a third, and what was it, two stoners? No, and a fourth person, a fifth person who became a good friend. Yeah. Fifth, yep. And two stoners. Exactly it. Yeah, yeah, and he had his I like his inside man, who was a guy who had had seen him had perform. seen him perform. Well, he also he illegally went to the uh, what was it called the Not, uh, to Notre Dame. Yeah, and the two spies in Notre Dame, he did a tightrope uh, in in between those, and of course he was arrested. <laughs> and this person actually happened to just see him and knew who he was, and then wanted to get in on the action. Yeah, he realized he recognized him and and realized that he was possibly up to something. Yes. And when he when he found out what the plan was, yeah, definitely I'm in. Oh, absolutely. I'm actually trying to find out if he's ever done anything 
since in that like as in anything as major and no he hasn't like that was his big thing that's what he did however what he did do he uh because he does get of course in trouble he gets caught yeah and the judge sentences him to community service and the community service is he has to perform in central park yeah and which he said he did with you know of course he wanted to keep on performing because he was a performer yeah and so to bring joy to those kids and to bring for people he kept on performing and i'm actually reading here as well he continued to do it like long after he had he didn't have to do it anymore because right. he just fell in love with New York. He loved the city and he just loved entertaining. He well, loved that's great. It. I, I, I have no idea if this man is still alive. I'm looking it up now. He is. He's 66 years old. That's great. And still lives in New York. That That's great. This, this movie, plot-wise, is so simple. Like, it is just this man's passion yep. to do performance and specifically tightrope walking and to make his mark on the world. And the adventure is really in the the way his passion becomes an obsession. Yes. And how it affects the people around him. Indeed. And to the point where he's, he's quite literally insane. Absolutely. Well, he's so, like you're saying, obsessed. He was so obsessed with it. You know, you look at that point just before he was going to do it and he can't sleep. And so he's there and he's nailing, as he calls it, the coffin which has got all the equipment in it that they've got to sneak into the trade well trade center and he's there hammering this thing and he goes I've got, i forgot to hammer the coffin now shut the coffin and they're going don't call it that don't call it that and he goes well you know that's what it is in my mind because this thing could lead to his death because he's doing this without safety he had no safety rope there was nothing to catch him it, if he fell when when the the man who trained him Hmm. gave his advice, use a cable, yep. you know, a, a safety harness, use it. And the only reason I say this is because I consider you like a son. Yep. And if it was my boys doing this, I want them to be safe. Actually, let's go back on that a little bit because we kind of really jumped ahead. And, you know, talking about the plot and the story, you know, large, well, pretty much this movie is his journey to it. Like really the type, because him walking the doing the tightrope on the World Trade Center, that happens at the end. But it's him getting his journey from being a child, from being a simple street performer to, you know, getting in with Ben Kingsley's character who is kind of like his mentor, you know, going through that process of how to do of how to actually do it and to become a performer you know it's his passion and really that's what this movie is it's the showing of his passion through this storytelling and i mean great actors to get doing it as well you know joseph gordon levitt he's just a chameleon he you know he is phenomenal in this movie. so good very very good i mean at first i was looking at him and like the makeup on him and so subtle like you, you can still see that it's him and it's like, okay. And I started to wonder whether the makeup also played a part in his ability to sort of just become this other person. I think he, because I look at a lot of the roles that he's done and he does use makeup or prosthetic or anything to try and change his appearance. And it almost does that when he does, he does take on that persona. And he does it 100%. 100%. Whether it's a that good it's role, bad role, or a good movie, bad movie, he gives it his all. And that's right. Well, he's a, you know what? He's a professional. Yes. And that's exactly what he is. And he, you know, he's come a long way since Third Rock from the Sun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And even in that, he was fucking really good. I've rewatched some episodes of that recently, and he is still very, very funny in that. He was only a teenager. And the way he just becomes this other person throughout this movie. Absolutely. You get lost in his performance. It's just amazing. And the people that are around him who actually are French people, yep. when you hear their accents and you hear his, he must have worked on this a lot. I actually do wonder if he's a French speaker because when he was speaking French as well, it sounded perfect. I know. Like it, it sounded it was just very incredible. well done. Incredible. Yeah. I was really taken aback by his performance. I wonder if he is a French speaker because it's just, he does it so perfectly. I can't help but think he has to be. He has to be a French speaker or at least have some form of French background or. Well, it could also just be the fact that he, he would have had some kind of uh, linguist. Yeah, that's you know, true as well. Some Someone to, to teach him how to pronounce the words properly. I oh, probably did actually. You're probably right. And he's probably because he's such a, once again, such a good actor that he's just learned how to do it well properly. Properly. Now, speaking of actors, um, do, did we find that the characters in this storytelling gelled well? I think so. I, I found that they all worked well together. They interacted well. I was never taken apart from this movie in any one moment thinking they don't work well chemistry-wise on screen. That Everything seemed to sort of really fit. The only person that I kind of, and both of them really, you know when they get the two people at the end, you've got that real stoner guy, the yeah. one who's pretty much just like a long-haired shaggy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they didn't gel. I just I thought for the tone of the movie, he was a little bit out of place. Well, I think it's also the fact that, A, it's the 70s. 
Yeah. 70s New York, so you've probably got some stoners going around. Oh, I'm sure you do. But I also think it's the fact that these characters are people that they needed last minute and never really thought about it. And, you know, because of the, the time frame that they had to pull this off, yeah, they didn't have the... Well, in Philippe's mind, they didn't have the time to actually source someone trustworthy. And that's where, you know... You, Anyone will do because I really need to get up there. And you get that because, you know, the stoner guy is the first one that, you know, goes, oh, God, we're going to get caught, you know, and has to leave. And they bail. And he's, bails. His friend, pretty much, the, the, the his friend that's the photographer, said from the beginning, can't trust these guys. Yeah, and they both... Well, the other one doesn't bail. Remember what he does. He, he stays starts, there... He starts taking photos. photos to, and to, cause they, to sell them. Yeah. Yeah, which I thought was fucking dog act. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, you can't trust those two. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, the the main female uh, lead, so she, the who plays his girlfriend, um, I can't pronounce her name, I want to say uh, Charlotte Le Bon. Char- yeah, Le Bon. She's yeah. fantastic. She's been in a lot of stuff, actually, and she's absolutely fantastic. She's brilliant. She's actually not French. She's uh, she's French-Canadian. Oh, there we go. Well, well, that's not French. It's French-Canadian. <laughs> But it's still French. Yeah, it's yeah. One thing I wanted to bring up was actually I had no idea he was in this movie. And when he appeared, it was surprising. It was a nice breath of fresh air. And that was um, Ben Kingsley. Yes, yes. I had no idea he was in this movie. I wasn't even paying attention to the, the opening credits to see the people's names pop up or anything like that. I saw his name pop up and I was... I didn't realise who he'd play. I thought he would have played... Well, actually, no, he played the role he would have should have played because he played the mentor character. Mm. But um, the moment I heard his voice, because, fuck, he's got a distinctive voice. Yeah. Re- you know, even when he's putting on an accent, it's a very distinctive voice. Well, he's, speaking of accent, he's, if I was to have a fault in this, in his performance, there was one moment where I think he forgot what accent he was actually doing. Yeah. And there was, it just sounded like he was speaking British, like with his British accent. And then it somehow changed. You know what it sounded like to me? What? French Mandarin. Really? Yeah. You know when he played the Mandarin? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It> was, <you're, laughs> like I seriously thought he's, it, you know, start going, <laughs> you know, the fortune cookie, but in French. <laughs> the, le fortune cookie is a American invention. And I can't do it very well. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I feel sorry for all the French people. Out yeah. There. Sorry, guys. My French is not very good. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, his his performance was really nice to the letter. Oh yeah, very typical uh, character in that the mentor initially hates the student. Yep, wants to take his money, but in the end, he never really spent any of it. No, and I like that. That was actually a really good, I think, story touch. Yeah, to show you know. Yeah, I'll take your money. And I love it. Every time he got a piece of advice, he had to give him money. Yeah. And he just kept on, you know, he'd give him a piece of advice. And I think the one, oh, what was it? That's right. He went to do the walk and he was just before he got onto the ledge and he stumbled. Yeah. Remember, they're in the big top. And yeah. so Joseph got a levit. He's there and he's he's just he's on the ledge. He's like, oh, great. I've made it. But he hadn't actually made That's it yet. That's right. Yeah. And then he started to fall and he actually did fall and then got himself off. And Ben Kingsley said, character goes, says something along the lines of, you know, it's when you've got those last three steps before you're safe. That's when you think you've made it. But that's when most tight work ropers will fall and, and that's how they lose their lives. Because until you make that last step, you haven't finished. Yeah, true. Um, and mm. then he goes to pay him and he goes, no, no, that one I'll give you for free. Yeah, because that's basically his character's kind of like, you know what, I will give you this one because anyone should know this one. Yes, exactly right. And I like it that once again, fast forwarding to the end, when he actually is doing the tightrope walk, there are points where I think, come on, just make it actually, that really made me feel tense because I'm like, come on, make that last step, make that last step because you're not safe until you're on that fucking ledge. Well, the funny thing was, the way this movie is, when it gets to that stage and like he initially does his walk and you're like, ah, oh, you actually, I felt relaxed with him. Really? You did? Yeah. I didn't. I was the like, way can this you movie, get the fuck the, off that thing now? <laughs> <laughs> the way this movie plays out with yeah. with like initially when he goes to start the walk and his, his mind is foggy and clouded by the, the notion of, I'm going to fall. This is going to be my demise. And then when he clears his mind and takes that first step, the clouds dissipate and he can see what's under him. And he's like, I'm going to perform for these people. Yeah. I actually felt a sense of relief because he wasn't burdened with anything. Yes. And you talk about how you feel a lot of tension. And by the point when he starts making multiple crosses across the wire, you're supposed to feel that tension as well. But they do it in a lighthearted motion that it's kind of like, yeah, cool, this is great, but you know what? Maybe you should get off. 
I didn't feel that because of one thing. I was so interested with the character thanks to jo- Joseph Gordon-Levitt's performance that I actually looked up some history mm. on Petit, on uh, Philippe Petit. Yeah. And I already knew that he walked the wire eight times. Oh, really? He walked the wire eight times before getting off. Oh, really? Yeah. So I knew it was kind of coming and I knew that, okay, well, he's clearly alive. Like he, he made it off there. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, yeah, I, I didn't feel that tension the way that most people should. I think I did. You know, it's really a testament more before... Well, it's actually, we'll probably talk about this when we talk about the technical side of things, but because um, of just how well it was shot, because it actually had that sense that he's fucking 400 <laughs> metres up in the air. He's 100 stories up. Well, well, Holy shit. Well, <laughs> if speaking, he falls- speaking of, like, the character and, and so forth, when he makes his walk, I think it's the first step or the, the first crossing, I think it was, he realises that the, the only way to support the wire that far and that high with the wind also yeah. playing a factor is that the, the anchoring lines couldn't be below to pull tension. It had to be side on. Yes. And one of the brackets is upside down. Yes, you know, yeah. And like he just casually just goes over the top. Yep. And he's like, oh, okay, that's that's the wrong way. Yeah. And he actually says that as well. He goes, I noticed it was it, but it didn't matter. And It didn't matter because I've got my three bolts. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben Kingsley, whatever the character's name was. I can't even remember now. Um, ben Kingsley's character. Yeah. It is Papa Rudy. Papa Rudy. So, yeah, when, when he crosses over and he sees the three bolts, he's like, thank you, Papa Rudy, because I, it doesn't matter now because I've got my three bolts. Yep. But, um, yeah, the, the way... <sighs> This movie, I'm just going to go straight into it. This movie's uh, visual presentation yep. is stunning. Oh, very stunning. At first, I'm like, wow, those effects are actually quite jarring. They're not smooth. They're, they stick out like dog's balls. And then I realized that it was actually an artistic choice. Yeah. And it makes this movie seem more beyond... I was going to say beyond words, but that's not the right phrasing. It seems, it makes this movie feel larger than life. Yep. And the fact that this character, this person was a performer and wanted to show the world that he's he's got some kind of thing to give. Yep. That this, the special effects in this movie are just as vibrant and full of life as this person is. Yes. Yes. And it really helps tell the story. What did you think, though, of... Because, I mean, I, I know, obviously, this was shot for, to be seen in 3D. Right. And now I didn't obviously I didn't watch on 3D. I downloaded it off iTunes. And there's scenes in it, like, where he's juggling and things are obviously meant to be in 3D. And you could tell that if that was in 3D, it was meant to be coming out at you and shit like this. Right. What did you think of that? Because I actually... I really didn't like it. I mean, I there's times when I've seen movies, for example, throwing one out there, Avengers 1. And, you know, uh, Hawkeye does the good old arrow at the screen, mm. which if you watch in 3D, great effect. But on the 2D screen, it's just... Uh, it's pointless. It's pointless. What is it, like, I actually found them in this because the movie was so bright, they looked really fake. And then it, so it kind of took away from but what he was actually that's doing. That's what I'm talking about. So when the first lot of effects happen at the start, particularly the opening of the movie. Yeah. So the opening of the movie has Joseph Gordon-Levitt in character at the torch of the Liberty Statue, Statue of, Liberty. of Liberty. Yeah. And it looks like a set. Yes. It looks really out of place. Yeah. But then you see the way that the effects are being used. At first, it's very jarring and it looks almost cheap. Mm. And it was... That's what I was saying. Like, it looks like it should not have been used by yep. any stretch of the means. But because you go through this character's development and the way he is larger than life, he wants to be larger than life, yep. that the the effects play into that. Okay. So the other thing is because they continuously use the same style of the mm. effects throughout the movie, it becomes a part of the movie. Mm. It's not like... The movie was great up until this point where it just didn't look right. They should have spent more time in it. No, they purposely did that throughout this movie. That's that's the sense that I'm getting from there you go. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. Because I, I did get that, I mean, especially certain uh, camera angles and especially certain, co- like the use of colour was a very big thing in this. You yeah. Know, they made sure that every colour was very vibrant. I mean, especially when he was doing the first walk over the lake. Yeah. The greens. Yeah. Oh, so beautiful. Anyway, from, the, you know, there's that. But that does, you know, yes, it looks vibrant. It doesn't look fake. 
But at the same time, when you get those effects, like I said, those, I want to say, I think maybe it's because it's the tacky 3D effect. Maybe. I don't like it. I think because especially now the way that I think 3D cinema has evolved, it's not that we want things coming out at us. It's the depth that we want. Yeah. And we don't need fucking like spoon juggling spoons going in, into our faces. We don't need that. No, true. We I do agree with you that 3D, if... If you happen to see a film in 3D, that the best way it has been showcased in the past Mm. is not coming out at you, it's going in. Yeah, it's where you feel like you're And apparently Life of Pi is a perfect example of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were one of the first films to sort of really push that boundary in their effects going into the screen rather than out. And that's where I actually really feel like I would have loved to have seen this movie in 3D at the cinema because especially when you do get some of the points when he's up on the wire in the t- on the two towers, when he's on the wire in the um, big top, anytime he's on the wire actually, when they do the shot down from his feet... You yeah. really get that sense of depth, and that it is far, and that he is on this. You know, he's ha- he's on a he's on a wire high up. It would help with the notion of height of not not that, but the tense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Feeling of you know, you need to do this right. Yeah, exactly right, and that's where. So I could see why they would want to do it in three D because you could definitely have that effect going on. So it's a great visual effect. It would also help the all the audience see at least in some part what he would have been experiencing exactly on the wire at four hundred meters. Exactly. Saying that though, I still believe. I do believe. Sorry, um, that it's it's still in two D. Like it is in standard, you know, viewing. Still get that same tension. You still understand that he's high. Like you still get it. Yeah. It just would have been an added feature, really. Yeah, no, no, exactly right. Like in 3D, I think this, the point you're trying to get at yeah. is that it just would add that depth. Of, add that little bit of yeah. something. Yeah. So, but in, in essence, this movie, I think is shot well. I think it's, the colors are used great. I think the effects, even though they're starking at first, mm. if you bear with it, it complements it. Yes. I don't. I honestly don't think it is an issue of this film. Mm. I think once you get past that initial idea of wow, that that doesn't really look right, and you realise that it's actually a character of the movie. Yep. It, it actually assists in the type of storytelling that they're doing in this movie, which is a fourth wall narration. Yep. And um, I think it's just the story is really written well. The everything sort of just plays really well together. Yeah. And not surprising considering. This film is from Robert Zemeckis. Oh, yeah. And look, he is big on visual. You know, he's a very good fil- visual filmmaker. He's a good director, a good writer as well. Oh, I he's mean, very good. You know, hello, the, the Back to the Future series. Oh, so. exactly. So, but yeah, I mean, I really didn't have an issue with this movie. I was entertained the entire way. I was actually really feeling what the characters were feeling, particularly the night before when Philippe was losing his mind. Oh, yeah, you definitely felt that. And the characters are like, you need to rest, you need to sleep, you're driving everyone insane, people are frightened. Yeah. You know, and when he when he's like, you should at least thank them. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes in. And, and he comes like- in in the middle of the night and, and just absolutely just scares the shit out of everyone. Yeah. I felt that same tension yeah. in those moments. And it's actually funny, like when we see, because we keep on using the word tension, and I think there is a build up of tension in this movie ever so subtly. Because th- what this man is about to do is going to be something that's going to have high adrenaline, lots of fear, high risk, you know, name everything that you could possibly get out of this, you know, out of it. And as the movie progressed, we've said it before, he gets more insane because he's getting so obsessed with it and you're feeling it. Well, it kind of drives home when they manage to get to the roof. And he needs to find the fishing line. Yes. Right? So the idea of... How they're going to connect how the wire. They, how they get this wire across is the same ploy they did in, in France. In Notre Dame, yeah. So in, in Notre Dame, it was they throw a kind of like a, a tennis ball or something yep. with some fishing line attached, pull the line, yep. and when you get to the end, you attach a rope, yep. pull it back, and then you've got your cable. So and you ba- pull your cable. Exactly right. So they thought, okay, this can work for this. But we've got some odd hundred meters to shoot the yeah. uh, didn't say it's like one hundred and forty feet, something like that. Yeah, so that, that's a great distance. You can't just throw a tennis ball. Oh, it could be one hundred and forty feet. So that's the idea was anyway. we'll attach the line to an arrow and we'll shoot it with a bow. Yeah, which is all well and good, but the arrow doesn't land where it's meant to. Exactly right, and it really drives home how insane he is to get this line, thinking, okay, it's the middle of the night, I've got no lights, I can't see the fucking line. Uh, 
maybe I should expose a little bit more skin so I can feel the line on me to the point where he's completely fucking naked. Yeah, and he's running trying to grab this. <laughs> he's dancing this weird rain dance <laughs> trying to catch this line. And it just, it really shows how fucking mental this guy became obsessingly trying to finish his task. And it had to be that night. Couldn't be any other night. Why? We don't even know. Well, it's because it's the night that he said that he'd do it. Initially, he said, this is a good night to do it. Yeah. But they could have done it a month later. Yeah, well, exactly. Or a week later. Oh, weren't they waiting because if the weather shifted? I don't know. I can't remember. I, thought there was I can't remember, to be honest. Yeah. But he, he was just obsessed. The You know, it has to be this night. has yeah. to be this night. And to the point where they they managed to get through on bloody luck. Oh, well, what about with the um the the guard? Just pure luck. Yeah, and they had to stay on that beam for God knows how long. They lost something like two hours. Oh, my God, that would be so painful. You know, thanks to a security guard sleeping on his night shift. Yeah. In somewhere he probably should never have been. That's right. But, yeah, so for me, this this movie is just... It's a piece of history, but told in a way that's also fantastical. Yes. And it, it just... It really shows, like, this... The vision of a dreamer yeah. from a kid to an adult where he never really grows up really Mm. until the very last moment. And once he's done his job as well, Mm. he finally, for example, when he meets with Ben Kingsley the last time, they really have a heart to heart, like two professionals. Yes. Rather than a teacher and a child. Yeah. And I think, I think that development in the character as well is, is really nice. Well, it's the, um, you know, and it's funny that you say, uh, the, you know, of a dreamer. And I think that's a great reason why, I mean, anytime you do a biographical pick, you've got to have that whole, well, one, the drama, <laughs> um, but uh, more, you know, you've got to have that fantastical because it's generally based on someone who did have a dream and did do something that is so great. And, you know, these are the people that shape our lives, really. If you think about it, you know, you watch any one of these movies, you know, even watching uh, like Steve Jobs or you watch, uh, what was it called? The Imitation Game yeah. and things like that, you know, these these people were so were thinking so big outside the box that they were able to do something that no one has ever done before and some people never done again yeah i mean i was reading a blurb of this movie at one point and they said you know 12 men have have walked on the moon but only one person has managed to walk between the twin towers and that's exactly it and it really is just a a, a piece of of history like this man did this thing mm mm-hmm. mhm and has been known for it for his entire life since. Trained for, like, not only that, he trained himself how to do it or planned the whole thing on it well, with, with friends, but they planned it, they organized it. The cabling that they've got, like the whole thing, meticulously planned and it worked. And the funny thing was when he did what he needed, he felt he needed to do. Yeah. And he got off, even though he was arrested and even though people were frightened for his life. Yeah. They all found it impressive. That's what I mean. Like he was punished yeah. to do community service and to do what he loves and he was happy to. But also I love that even that he, um, you know, the visitor's card. Yeah. You know, he was For given, life. Yeah. You know, it just said it on forever and it would have been until they went down. And even he said, I, you know, he'd still go up there. Like he'd not to walk it, but just to, you know. Just to have a look. Because he loved it. He also loved the building so much. You know, this the fact that he did it. And, you know, imagine what, seeing it from that different, he would have seen it from a different way than anybody else would have. It's amazing. Yeah. It's fantastic. And I think Robert Zemeckis and... Joseph Gordon-Levitt and everyone in this have done a fantastic job in bringing it to life. I think so. I think it's time to uh, rate this one. Yep. You want to go first? I'll go first. For everything that we've been saying, this movie is great. It's a great piece of storytelling. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is just amazing in this movie. The effects, yes, they're very starkish, and at first they they sort of bounce at you, making you think, fuck, am I watching a really bad kids movie? But it is part of it. It becomes a character of the movie. If I was to fault this movie, it would be just that. Yep. But like I said, if you stick with it, you end up appreciating it. I'm going to give this one four bananas. Mm, Nice. Well, you know, it's funny. It's one of these movies as well that talking to you about it has actually made me my appreciation, you know, go go up for it. I was, you know, a bit at first when I watched it, I was like, oh, yeah, it's not bad. Now I am like, it's actually pretty well done. Still can't get over the tacky 3D effects. I can understand. The points. It's just, that's something though, that's always something that's graded me. I always thought it looked tacky and so I don't like that. And, you know, some of the ensemble casts uh, kind of felt like, yeah, okay, they were needed for the story, but really were they? Could you not maybe portray them a little bit differently? Maybe that's exactly how they were and it was an accurate portrayal, but I don't know. I kind of went, meh. Yeah, I can, I can understand that too. So for me, 
there were a few faults in it, but at the same time, I would totally recommend it. I think if you haven't seen it, get it on iTunes. It's cheap as. Get it. <laughs> That's a good selling point. This movie is great. It's really fucking cheap. But you know what I mean? As in, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you go and get the uh, the HD version on iTunes for like $9, so go for it. Yeah. So, you know, why not? I'm going to give it three and a half bananas. Three and a half bananas. Banana. Okay, so that was our discussion on The Walk. So check it out. It's a really good, fun movie. And... Uh, yeah, I, I can understand if some people have issues with the, the special effects in this movie, but I really do think it's got a charming appeal. I'm actually now thinking of getting the 3D Blu-ray and giving it a go. And see if, what the differences yeah, are. Yeah, see, see if I enjoy it. Anywho. All right. Well, anyway, we'll see you next week. And don't forget to stay for the end of the theme song if you want to find out what this week's movie Who Am I is. Indeed. Bye. See ya. All right, so you've stayed on to find out what this week's movie, Who Am I, is, and the answer is... Groundhog Day. (laughs) It's definitely (laughs) not Groundhog Day. I wonder if you can get this one, Heath. Okay, go on. So it's three trappers on a mission to protect the colonel's daughter and in the middle of a war. Yes. Kentucky Fried Chicken, The Untold Story. (laughs) No. (laughs) Then no, I've got nothing. (laughs) It is The Last of the Mohicans. Oh, shit, I have not seen that movie in years. From 1992, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, Madeline Stowe, Russell Means, and a whole bunch of white guys portraying Indians. Ah, yes, well, that's nothing new. Um, (laughs) Gosh, no, I think the last time I saw that movie, I would have been 12 years old. Probably. I remember seeing this movie in the cinema with my parents, and I was just amazed at the style and the uh, performance of... And the period that this movie is set in, I realised at that point that I just I, I had a liking to colonial movies. Well, there you go. Yeah, actually, there's one I wouldn't mind rewatching. I've got to give it. Might have to revisit that one. I'm I'm scared to revisit it in the fact that it is incredibly dated. Mm-hmm. But I would be piece, willing though. to do it. Yeah, I suppose. You know, saying that though, you rewatch some of those old westerns where it's all white people playing characters that aren't white, yeah. and they do come across as somewhat dated. <laughs> anyway, we'll see you next week, guys. Bye. See ya. This podcast is recorded and produced by Theatre Gorillas, edited by Dan Clark. <laughs> you love playing with those. Love it. I'm not talking about balls. I'm talking about the uh, Batmobiles on top of the sound card.